So uh, grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Jeremiah. We left off in Jeremiah 48, and we're going to pick it up in verse 45. Jeremiah 48, starting in verse 45. And what we're looking at now, just to remind you, is the end part of the book of Jeremiah, chapters 46 through 51, are what uh, is called the judgment of the nations. So we're looking at the book primarily focusing on the judgment of the southern kingdom of Israel. And now we learn that God's judgment doesn't just stay with the children of Israel, but His judgment goes out to all the nations. As we go through these nations, and um, there's going to be ten of them. Egypt was the first one, then Philistia, Moab is the current nation we're talking about, Ammon is the next one, Edom, Damascus, Kedar, Hazor, Elam, and Babylon. We're not going to get to Babylon tonight. Um, chapters 50 and 51 are going to deal with the judgment of Babylon, so we're going to look at that. And then chapter 52 is a summary of the judgment of Jerusalem. So, this is uh, one of those books, really, and particularly a section of Scripture that is not the, I don't know if you want to say the fun part of the Bible, if you look at it kind of like that. Um, if you're kind of into the psychological, feel-good, self-seeking kind of message, this is not a good message for you. Um, but we have to teach the balance word, right? This is maybe one of those sections, if you read through the Bible, it's kind of, you really read through really fast and don't understand a lot of the details that are going on. But you know what, as we're going to... Um, approach this and look at this it's amazing to see when you start taking your time a little bit and start looking at some of the things going on you you find so many nuggets i've been studying this for weeks now and every time i study there's just more and more things that that i'm learning and that come out so that's one of the benefits of being able to do a study like this and come together and really take some time looking at these things. And I would encourage you on your own when you're studying the Bible, one of the best things that you can do is just start asking yourself questions. Uh, or better, ask the Bible questions. Say, you know, well, what is that? And, you know, you come across a term that you don't know or a nation or a country or a thing you don't know. Just start asking yourself, well, what's that? Start praying about it and start digging in and start researching that. This is when um, we start going from milk to meat in our study of the Bible. We start to understand the deeper things of the Word of God. And you know, it's a lifelong pursuit. That's the amazing thing. I, I can read, just like we're going through the book of Matthew, there are things in there that I've read, taught, had taught to me, over and over again. And as we're, we're preparing and going through these studies on Sunday, it's like I'm reading it brand new. That's an amazing thing about the Bible. I get bored of things really fast. Books, movies, things like that. But it's amazing if you take your time, ask yourself, what does that mean? And why is that there? And, and you start to pray. And then, you know, now there's so many online resources. You know, you have so much information at your fingertips to look this stuff up, but you also got to be careful with that because there's a lot of false doctrine and um, false teachings and things like that. And you may say, well, how do we know yours isn't false teaching and false doctrine? And that's a good question. And you should be saying that. Well, the Bible tells us we all should be Bereans. We're all responsi responsible to look at God's Word, see what, is it, what, is it, what it says, and measure everything by that. So we encourage that. We encourage you yourself to get into the Word, see what it says, and compare what somebody else says with the Word of God. So anyway, with that, as we look at the judgment of the nations, 
I'm going to try to bring out these kind of, some of these nuances in regards to judgment. Judgment is something that we see in the Bible. Judgment is something that many people will um, prefer to avoid, not think about, or sort of come up with their own doctrine about that. But it's there. We've seen it in history. We're told about that in the future. And we're told that every single individual will stand before God one day to give account. And that's why when we read these things about a ju a judgment, the judgment of God, it's so good to know that Jesus took our judgment from us. When I read these things, I, it just makes me think, thank God I don't have to go through that. Thank God He rescued me. Praise the Lord. So with that in mind, chapter 48, starting in verse 45, we're looking at the tail end of the judgment of the Moabites, which were a nation that was uh, descendants from Lot, if you remember Lot in the Bible. If you don't, then that's one of those things you can go and read. Oh, who's Lot? What's Lot all about? Let me check it out. That's one of those things. So Lot and his uh, incestuous relationship with his daughter created the Moabites. And the Moabites, so they're kind of cousins of the children of Israel, and they were in a region. This is good to look at your maps, too. We might have a map up there, hopefully, but um, the Moabites were on the eastern part of the desert. Can you see it up there? So, in the, you see the blue. This is really good. If you're watching online, I got to go over here for a second, so hang on. So, I don't have my glasses, so <laughs> this is really good. So, right in the middle here, that's the Jordan River, right here. And the Jordan River goes right into the Dead Sea. Okay, if you go to Israel, you're going to go to all these places. So, the Ammonites are out here in the desert. So, this is east, this is the desert. Um, down a little lower are the Moabites. So that's in the green here, like the camouflage green. We're going to talk about the Edomites in a little bit. But notice in, on the other side of the Jordan River, you have the nation of Israel split in two parts, north and south. You see that? This northern kingdom has already been taken captive. Now we're dealing with the southern kingdom called Judah, and they were just... In our text, in our book of Jeremiah, they were just taken captive. So they were conquered. Jerusalem was the final place of the conquering. And so we dealt with all this judgment. And if you go really to the furthest part of the screen, you see the Assyrian Empire. They were the ones that came down and conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And then you, the Babylonian Empire was the one that conquered the southern kingdom. As we go down this way a little more, that's where you get into Egypt. So Egypt is south. Israel, so Israel would be all right here. And then, of course, this is the Mediterranean Sea on the western part of that. So and that's the Philistine, uh, Philistine cities and states that we covered. So that's really good to kind of get your bearings for what we're talking about. If you're listening online, we're coming back. All right, so... If you're listening online, it'd be really helpful to have a Bible map in front of you. You can even um, Google Jeremiah or Jeremiah 49 or 48, and then um, click where it says images, and you'll find a bunch of maps on there. So with that, look at verse 45. So we're dealing with the Moabites. And it says, those who fled under the shadow of Heshbon, which is a city in Moab. It says, because of exhaustion, but a fire shall come out of Heshbon, that's referring to the Babylonians, a flame from the midst of Sihon, another city in Babylon, I mean in uh, Moab, 
and shall devour the brow of Moab, the crown of the head of the sons of Tumult. And then it says, Woe to you, O Moab, the people of Kamash perished. That was their false god that they worshipped. It says, For your sons have been taken captive, and your daughters captive. And then it says, Yet I will bring back the captives of Moab, and it's a key term, in the latter days, says the Lord. So when we're dealing with the book of Jeremiah, and also uh, many of the prophetical books in the Bible, there is uh, something called near prophecy and afar prophecy. So a lot of these prophecies, they have, they're foretelling of specific events that are going to happen in and around the time that they're written. So those now, from our vantage point, will be historical events. So we should be able to look back and see historical events where these things happen. But like in this case, it says in the latter days, that's re referring to a future time. This is referring to a, a time that the Bible uh, refers to as the millennial kingdom. So during this millennial kingdom, which is yet future, God says he'll bring the Moabites back. So now we move into chapter 49, and we look at a new group. So this group, in verse 1, it says, this is, uh, I'm sorry, it says, Against the Ammonites, thus says the Lord, he says, Has Israel no sons? Has he no heir? Why then does Milcom inherit Gad? And his people dwell in its cities. So, you're probably wondering, what are all those things? Well, a little research will tell you that the Ammonites were a people that lived in the land that God gave to the people of Gad, G-A-D. So if you remember, there were two and a half tribes that did not cross the Jordan and go into the promised land. Those two and a half tribes were Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. So when the children of Israel went into the promised land, God set up the territory in the promised land for different tribes to have different portions of the land. But Gad, Reuben, and half of the tribe of Manasseh said, you know what, we like this area. And if you notice on the map, it's on the east side of the Jordan River. Remember, a big part of the going into the land was the children of Israel crossing the Jordan. The book of Joshua, you know, leading them in and crossing the Jordan. So in, in this, these tribes then, they settled on the other side or the eastern side of the Jordan River. Now, as the Assyrians and the Babylonians came down and the Assyrians the north and the Babylonians the south, well, the children of Israel, in particular the tribe of Gad, were sort of taken out of the territory. And the Ammonites came into their territory. And they said, this is our territory now. So what we find here is, is very interesting because God is very particular about boundaries and borders. And in Acts 17, 27, it says God actually pre-appoints the boundaries of our dwelling. So God situates all these things. And um, as we speak, a big problem is the land in the Middle East. So whose land is it? So that's why as a Bible-believing Christian, we believe that God gave the land to Israel. It's Israel's land. We support Israel in the land because of that reason. So, so this is what God's saying. He's saying, why do you think you can move into this territory when, especially when my people were so weak and so vulnerable? And when they moved in, they brought in their 
idol worship. So that um, Milcom is also Molech. That's a, a god that you may be familiar with. That's the, the god that they would sacrifice babies to. So they're in the land, and, and the Lord's saying, I, I've, you're, this is not something that I don't see. I see what's going on. I notice what's going on, and I'm not good with it. So in verse 2, it says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will cause to be heard an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites, that's a city in Ammon. This is also where modern-day Jordan is. And um, the capital of Jordan is, uh, right, Ammon. That's where that comes from. And another cool thing is, um, if you go to Israel, you can go there and see this, all this stuff. It says, It shall be a desolate mound, and her villages shall be burned with fire. Then Israel shall take possession of his inheritance, says the Lord. So you notice there, God says this is Israel's, and the reason it's Israel's is because they inherited it from me. So in verse 3, it says, Wail... Or cry, O Heshbon, for Ai is plundered. Ai is a, another city here in this area. And this is not the same Ai, if you remember, where the children of Israel first went in. It was the second city that they conquered or kind of didn't have a lot of success, actually, after Jericho. So the children of Israel went in, and it was first Jericho, they went around the walls of Jericho how many times? How many? Seven. Seven. The walls fell down. And then they proceeded to go, and then Ai was the next place. And then they disobeyed God there, and they didn't have as much success, except they're, they're successful in realizing that they need to be obedient to the Lord. But anyway, this is a different Ai. It says, cry, you daughters of Rabbah, gird yourselves with sackcloth, lament and run to and fro by the walls, for Milcom shall go into captivity with his priests and his princes together. And then he says, why do you boast in the valleys? So their feeling was that the topography of the land with a lot of valleys, a lot of hiding places, that gave them a sense of security. And what we see going through all these judgments is God is showing all these different things that we trust in, that we have security in, that we find our identity in. And he's saying all, all these things are hay and stubble. All these things are going to be burned, destroyed, ruined, worn out. The, the encouragement for us is to understand that part of our growth in our relationship with God is that those attachments in our life that are false, those things we value inappropriately, the things that we find our identity in. Those things, God is going to suffer those things. Or in other words, God is going to, if we're serious about our relationship with God, He'll take those things through the fire, the refining fire, to burn away those attachments, those things that are not of the Lord. This is part of, of growing in the Lord. And this is valuable and important. And some of us here tonight, we may, may be going through a thing. And we ha just have to ask ourselves as we go through this, is, Lord, help me with my faith. Help me to let go of what I'm holding on to. Help me to surrender this situation to you. Help me to be free. Help me to trust you. And this is the, the theme that we see going through all of these judgments. Watch what happens next. So he says, in verse 4, he says, Why do you boast in the valleys, your flowing valley, 
O backsliding daughter. So that's an that's important term because of their inappropriate attachment and sense of security to their land, it caused them to backslide. So when I'm thinking about this, I'm, I'm thinking about a couple things, couple application. Is One is sometimes we can put an inappropriate attachment to where we live, to our country, to a place where, you know, whether Texas or America, and we take pride in that, we take pride in the system. And I, I don't think that's wrong to a certain extent. But I think that's wrong when we trust in that over God. I actually think when we start doing that, when we start trusting in America over the God of America, then we're in trouble. When we start thinking, well, Texas could never be like this state or that state, then we're in trouble because we're failing to realize the fallen nature of this world and the fallen nature of man. So they, they took great pride. Another application of this that I see is somehow how people, sometimes they can worship the creation over the creator. Some of you are nature lovers. Some of you love the outdoors. You love the trees. You love the mountains. You love the ocean. You love the lakes. You just feel alive when you're out there and you just feel thriving. And you should. But when you start worshiping that and the creation doesn't take you back to the creator now you've missed it so when you start hugging trees instead of jesus you've missed it you've come up short and the book of romans chapter one says that that um, when when people are following away from the lord they're worshiping the creation versus the creator so this this beauty of our creation it's a very beautiful amazing things in this world when we see those things, we should, we should say, great are you, God. Wow, look at that. That is amazing. It should point us to God. But when we just worship the creation, then I think we can fall into some of the traps here that the Ammonites were. So then he says, in verse 4, he says, they trusted in their treasures, saying, who will come against me? So they're saying, we're so powerful. We have so much military might that we've invested in. We have so many resources. We don't need anything else. And the Bible says some trust in horses and some in chariots, but we'll trust in the Lord. So they're falling into a trap that, that we can fall into. And these are the things that really set us against the cross. Because Paul said to the Philippians, those who are enemies of the cross, it says that their God is their belly, meaning they're ruled by their bodily appetites. They're ruled by pleasure entertainment they're ruled by eating they're ruled like those things are their idols so their god is their belly and belly and then it says their glory is their shame we're talking about this is what an enemy of the cross is so glory is their shame meaning you want everybody to think you're awesome you want all these fingers or thumbs up to come your way you want everybody to like 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 Notice, 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 me, 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 me. And that's your glory is your shame. To come to the cross, is, is you, all that dies. But then it says, your mind is on earthly things. Meaning you have an inappropriate attachment in your thoughts, in your actions, 
in what you do, inappropriate attachments to your life here on earth. So part of our growth in the Lord is He's trying to suffer all those things out of us. Will we let Him? See, one who embraces the cross, they don't live by their bodily appetites. They don't live for their own glory. And their mind isn't preoccupied and obsessed with their life in this world. The cross has broke us free from all those things. So the Ammonites, that was their description of what they were trusting in. So in verse 5 it says, Behold, I will bring fear upon you, says the Lord God of hosts. From all those who are around you, you shall be driven out, everyone headlong, and no one will gather those who wander off. You, you can't get away from God's judgment. And he says, but afterward... I will bring back the captives of the people of Ammon, says the Lord. So again, I believe this points to the millennial kingdom that many people in that part of the world, right now it's the Jordanians, people from Jordan, but those people in that area will have a place at the table in the millennial kingdom. That's amazing. So now he talks about Edom. Another good thing to do when you see these ten nations that, were being, that are being judged, should just get like a little three by five card and write the name of these um, nations. And then on the back, just write a whole bunch of facts about them. To the point where when you hear the word Edom, thoughts will start to come. One, the location, you'll notice Edom is in the yellow. So it's south. It's at the south end of the uh, Dead Sea there. And that's an important area biblically. And we'll see that a little bit more as this develops. But uh, Edom were people from Esau. So the brother of Jacob. So even more fraternal then the Ammonites and the Moabites were kind of cousins of Israel. Now you're looking at people that were really close to Israel. So Esau, we think of that. The book of Obadiah um, talks a lot about the Edomites. You might want to read that for a little more information. Um, the Edomites, another important aspect of the Edom Edomites were um, that's where... Herod in the New Testament comes from. He wasn't a, a Jew, but he was sort of from the, the close association with the children of Israel being the brother of Jacob. But the, the Jews were so offended because as an Idomean, that's what they were called, an Idomean, those who were in the line of Herod, Herod if in Jesus' Jesus' time was govern, governing for the Romans this area that the Jews lived in. He was an Edomite. So, I'm sorry, an Idomean. So he was looked at, and as Herod was looked at as kind of a, a traitor and a backstabber, being that he was working for the Romans and had a close association with the Jewish people. So that when you understand that, it gives you a little more uh, understanding of how the Jews felt about Herod. But anyway, so now the Edomites turn. It says, against Edom, thus says the Lord of hosts, is it wisdom, is, I'm sorry, is wisdom no more in Teman? So this is, a, that was a, a city in Edom. And if you read through the book of Job, you read about Eliphaz the Timonite, one of Job's counselors. And one thing that, that Job said to Eliphaz was, does wisdom end with you? In other words, are you the only one that's wise? You're the only one that knows any, anything? We get a little history and background about that statement 
because the Edomites prided themselves on wisdom. And Eliphaz, as he would counsel Job, then Job would say, so you're the only one that knows anything. You'll see that develop as we go, go on here, but it, in verse 7 it says, is wisdom no more in Teman? That's, that's what he's referring to. He says, has counsel perished from the prudent? Has the wisdom, has their wisdom vanished? He says, flee, turn back, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan, for I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him the time that I will punish him. And the calamity of Esau was referring to him selling his birthright, if you remember that. So um, Esau, or the Edomites, were descendants from Esau, and Esau sold his birthrights for a lot of money, you think? For a bowl of stew? Yeah, for a bowl of stew. So he, you know, that, that whole thing was just, he was a, a man driven by his passions and pleasures so much that he is willing to give up all his portion in God for worldly satisfaction. So it says in verse 9, it says, If grape gatherers come to you, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? Referring to the practice of when the gleaners would go through a field. Think about the book of Ruth. They would always leave some for the poor people to come through and pick up and eat. That was a common practice. So the question is, if grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? Yes, they would. If thieves by night, would they not destroy until they have enough? So he's saying if, like if somebody came and robbed your house, they would come and, and get what they wanted, but probably not more than that. So they, there, wouldn't be, there would be zero left in your house. They would just take some stuff and leave. So he's using that and he's saying, but I have made Esau bear. He's saying, this judgment that's going to come, it's going to completely wipe out. There's not going to be anything left, is what he's saying. He says, I have uncovered his secret places. Interesting. If you'll notice in the yellow, down south, there's a place called Petra. Probably this is referring to that. This place, Petra, is a secret place, and it was a place used to hide from enemies. It's a rock city, and here's the thing about that. The entrance into this rock city at this time was only one person was able to fit in the door at a time, in the opening. So when you would hide in there and somebody would come and, some, come and want to conquer, they would only be able to come in one at a time. And so when they would hide in there, they would be able to pick off each one as they came in. So they'd never be overrun by people. But what's interesting, some of you may know, in the book of Revelation, it tells us in the tribulation that the children of Israel in the last half of the tribulation, particularly right at the end, they're going to run probably to this place, Petra, and hide there. So this is God's going to um, miraculously protect them until He comes back. And when He comes back, that's where he's going to find the children of Israel, right at, right at that place. So, then he says, in verse 10, he says, And he shall not be able to hide himself. His descendants are plundered, his brethren and his neighbors, and he is no more. See, they're, they're just trusting that nothing can happen to us. We can hide in Petra, we have all this money, we have... These valleys, we have places, and we're good. But verse 12, it says, For thus says the Lord, Behold, those whose judgment was not to drink the cup have assuredly drunk. So what is that referring to? It's referring to the children of Israel who had a covenant relationship with the Lord. 
and who the whole book tells us were judged. So it says in verse 12, Behold, those whose judgment was not to drink of the cup. That, so God didn't intend the children of Israel to experience what they experienced. God set them up in the promised land, said He would be their defender, and did defend them and conquered the land for them until they decided to have their own king instead of God. That's why we're here. So Jeremiah is prophesying, saying, you know, the Lord says, if this happened to Israel, and they've assuredly drunk this cup of judgment, he says, and are you the one who will altogether go unpunished? So he's saying, so do you think that when you see all these other things happening, that even though you've rejected God and disobeyed God and have radically come against God, that you've escaped that? I find that so interesting. Because I, I see that being a very common theme in people's lives, that they feel like even though the Bible says that there's going to be judgment, even though we've seen judgment throughout the history of the world. But there's something that happens in a person's mind where they, they will say, I just don't believe God can do that. But He is. He does. And we have to ask ourselves, so, you know, a common theme, theme or thinking is, that there's other ways to get to heaven. Common thinking is that God is so loving that He will ignore everything except the good things that I do. There's a fundamental misunderstanding when one thinks that they're on some sort of merit system where they will hopefully do enough good things to get them in. But see, that's exactly opposite of what the Bible says. So, how dumb would God have to be to send His only begotten Son to take on human flesh and blood, and then go to the cross to die for our sins if we can get there a bunch of other ways. That, that wouldn't be very wise. And then you have to, have to realize that, that Jesus said Himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Me. What do you do with that? Or in Ephesians 2.8, it is by grace you are saved through faith, not of works. I mean, it can't be more clear. Not of works. Can you guys do that? <laughs> not of works. Wow. I wish you could see what I see. <laughs> but we have to... But here's the thing. The last thing. Think about this. Jesus in the garden prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this what? Cup pass from me. What? The suffering. Let it pass from me. me. What Jesus was saying, and, and Jesus knew, I believe he was saying this for this particular reason, so that we would know there's not any other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. It is God's will that the only way to the Father is through the Son. And receiving the Son by faith, not by works. We have to make that really clear. Because there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. And you, you know, you cannot come up with that if you read the Bible. You can't come up with that. When you come, when you read the Bible and just read it, what you realize 
is that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And maybe we really are good. But we're not good even close in comparison to God's holiness. We may be good compared to the person sitting next to you. But we're, we can't even come close to being good in comparison to the holiness of God. So that's really important. So, In verse 13, it says, For I have sworn by myself. Why does God swear by himself? Who else is he going to swear by? Right? When you're the supreme, almighty, highest being, you can't swear by anybody else. So God swears by himself. For I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that Basra, interesting, shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and all its cities shall be, a perpet shall be perpetual waste. Basra, Basra was a chief city in Edom. In that yellow portion on the screen, in the southern part, of the Dead Sea, a very important place because one, Petra's there. Two, that's prophetic in where the children of Israel will most likely be in the second coming when Jesus comes back. But get this. If you'll indulge me for a second and turn to the book of Isaiah, it's just one book to the left. Isaiah 63 We get some amazing information about Jesus' second coming. So Jeremiah is telling us prophetically, and I believe there is a, a near prophecy for what he is saying, but I also believe there's a far prophecy still waiting to happen. But notice in chapter 63, verse 1. Who is this who comes from Edom? With dyed garments from Basra. This one is speaking about Jesus. This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I who speak in righteousness am mighty to save. He's talking about Jesus coming in his second coming to save the children of Israel. This is saying that when Jesus first comes back, he doesn't go right to the Mount of Olives. Right? Sometimes in our thinking, we think, well, doesn't the Bible say Jesus is going to come back to the Mount of Olives? He's going to stand on it. It's going to split in two and there's an earthquake. It does say that. But he doesn't do that first. Look what verse 2 says. Uh, verse, yeah, verse 2. It says, Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes, for the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. We can go on, but let's turn back. So Jesus, when he comes, he comes to Petra, to Basra, to that place that we're looking at now, to get the children of Israel who have given their life to Christ and who are hiding from the Antichrist and that's where we see this war, this battle ensue that actually spreads all the way to Jerusalem through the Valley of Megiddo, which we may be familiar with hearing the term the Battle of 
Armageddon in the valley of Megiddo. So it seems like this, this war is going to start there and extend all the way to the Mount of Olives where Jesus stands on the mount conquering, ruling, and reigning with the church that comes with him. And then he'll proceed down the Mount of Olives to or through the east gate and go and sit on his rightful throne in Jerusalem. Gives me the chills. So all these things are in play right now. All these things are in play as we see that map. These are places right now that you can go visit and see. And we're going to these places this time in our trip to Israel in 2020, which is very exciting. So let's move on. Where did I end up? Um, verse 15. 14, for I have heard a message from the Lord, an ambassador has been sent to the nations, gather together, come against her, and rise to battle. For indeed, I will make you small among nations, despised among men. So it's the near prophecy is the Babylonians coming to destroy them. The far is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 16, your fierceness has deceived you. The pride of your heart, O oh, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, who hold the height of the hill, though you make your nest as high as the eagle, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. Edom also shall be in astonishment. Everyone who goes by it shall be astonished and will hiss at all its plagues, as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, and their neighbors, says the Lord, no one shall remain there, nor shall a son of man dwell there. You know what's interesting is this little tag phrase, Sodom and Gomorrah as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what the Lord is doing there? This is good for us. God's previous judgments should tell us something about His future judgments. He's doing that here. He's saying, as Sodom and Gomorrah, so we, we know about that, the Bible tells us about that, we, we, we understand that story, and He's saying, so it was like that, that's how your judgment's going to be, like Sodom and Gomorrah. And so what we can do is we can look at these judgments and we can say, well, there's still these judgments looking forward. Just as God promised and said, is that judgment coming? <laughs> I hope we have the uh, blood of the lamb on the doorposts. But what we can do is we say, you know, just as sure as we see these prophecies unfold in the Old Testament, we can be sure that they're going to happen in the future. And today we can be even more sure because we, we see like the actual things being put in place. So then Peter would say, in light of these things, how should we live? In light of knowing the future of this world and where everything is going and in light of individual personal judgment and in light of national judgment and world judgment, which is all in the Bible, how should we live? So in verse 19 he says, Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the floodplain, speaking of the Babylonians, the floodplain of the Jordan. That's kind of interesting because the, the Jordan River during the rainy season, will flood and overflow. And what happens is that overflow then will encroach upon the wildlife in the area, and they'd get this wildlife that would come out during those flood times, like, like the lion. So he's referring to that. And he's saying the Babylonians, that's how they're going to come. He says, against the dwelling place of the strong, 
but I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? God's saying, who's like me? Who are you going to have that is going to be your ruler or commander or president or chief or whatever or king that's, that's going to compare to me? Who's going to stand up to me is what he's saying. He says, who will uh, arraign me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? Verse 20, therefore... Hear the counsel of the Lord that he has taken against Edom and his purposes that he has proposed against the inhabitants of Teman. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their dwelling places desolate with them. The earth shakes at the noise of their fall and the, cry, and the cry is its noise heard at the Red Sea. Interesting, a reference to the Red Sea. The Red Sea was where God performed His deliverance. No doubt inserted here to remind them of their real deliverance that wouldn't be in themselves, their military, their treasures, their geography, but their real deliverance was and always will be in the Lord. Verse 22, Behold, he shall come up and fly like the eagle and spread his wings over Basra. The heart of the mighty men of Edom in that day shall be like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. Verse 23, our next nation, Damascus. Huge prophetical implications now looking forward. In Isaiah 17, it says that Damascus, which is the longest continually, continually occupied city in the world. Damascus. In, in Isaiah 17, it will be a heap of ruins. This is an amazing prophecy. Again, Damascus is the longest continually occupied city in the world. And Isaiah 17 says, in the last days that Damascus will be a heap of ruins. Has Damascus ever been a heap of ruins? Does it look like it's getting close? The next second biggest city in Syria is Aleppo. Is Aleppo a heap of ruins? Is there all kinds of crazy warfare all around Damascus right now? Are the Russians near Damascus in Syria? Are the Iranians in Syria near Damascus? Yes. Are there rockets going back and forth near Damascus? Yes, even right now. I guess actually there's a, a short ceasefire right now, but yesterday, the day before, there's movement going on there. So let's take a look at this. So this is the judgment against Damascus. It says Hamath and Arapad. These are two cities there. They are shamed for they have heard the bad news. They are faint-hearted. There is trouble on the sea. It cannot be quiet. Damascus has grown feeble. She turns to flee, and fear has seized her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her like a woman in labor. Why is this city of praise not deserted in the city of my joy. Therefore, her young men shall fall in her streets, and all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord of hosts. I will king kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall consume the practices of Ben-Hadad, which is one of their idols. Ben means sons, so the sons of Hadad. This was an idol that they worshipped. 
And so that's it for Damascus. Verse 28. Kedar and Hazer, these were referring to more of the Arab areas. These are primarily Bedouin pre people, nomadic people in the desert. Look what it says to them. It says, against Kedar and against the kingdom of Hazer, which Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, shall strike. Thus says the Lord, Arise, go up to Kedar, and devastate the men of the east. Their tents and their flocks they shall take away. See, that's the nomadic na nature of these people. They shall take for themselves their curtains and their vessels and their camels, and they shall cry out to them. See, they thought they were good because they were mobile. So they were trusting in, in the light of this Babylonian um, conquering. They thought, well, we're good because we can just pack up and move around. That's like when certain things happen, think of Y2K. You guys may remember that, but people thought the world was going to come to an end because of the computer systems weren't going to be geared towards 2000 and be able to change all those computers of the world so they thought they had shut down. But anyway, a lot of people are saying, you, you got to live in the hills. You're going to have to live an isolated life, live on the land, support yourself, and all that, and then you'll be good. It's kind of like that. So he's saying that's not even going to be the answer. Verse 29, the tents. And their flocks they shall take away. They shall take for themselves their cur curtains, their vessels, camels, and they shall cry out to them. Fear is on every side. Flee, get far away, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Hazar, says the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has taken counsel against you and has conceived a plan against you. And remember, the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar was like a sword in God's hand. God was actually using them as an instrument of judgment. Verse 31, Arise, this is speaking to the Babylonians, Arise, go up to the wealthy nation that dwells securely, says the Lord, which has neither gates nor bars, dwelling alone. Their camels shall be for booty, their multitude, or the multitude of their cattle for plunder, I will scatter to all winds those in the furthest corners, and I will bring their calamity from all its sides, size, says the Lord. Hazar shall be a dwelling place for jackals and a desolation forever. No one shall reside there, nor son of man dwell in it. And then finally, verse 34, our last nation for tonight, Elam, which is in Persia, which is Iran today. God has a word for them. And we'll finish with this. But I want you to notice just a quick Selah. The Lord keeps pointing out all these things that if we're trusting them, holding on to them, He's just basically dealing with all these things that can be idols, or can take the place of God, or things we hold on to, things that are our identity, things we put above God. That's really the message of this whole thing. So verse 34, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the king of Judah. So we've talked a lot about Zedekiah. He was the last king of Israel, who actually the King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, made him their vassal king, meaning he worked for Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. So this gives us a time frame. It says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the 
Elamites were known for their archery. It says, the foremost of their might. Against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. They're just going to be scattered everywhere. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. My fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them, the Babylonians, until I have consumed them. I will set my throne in Elam and I will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days I will bring back the captives of Elam says the Lord. So we made it. Wednesday night, reading about judgment, reading about God's wrath. Whoo, hallelujah. Good stuff, right? This is the meat of God's word. And we have still have a few minutes to take communion tonight. So let's be thinking about this. As we see this judgment... If you're a believer here tonight, rejoice. Because Jesus Christ has taken us out of judgment because He took our judgment on Himself. But not only that, when judgment comes to earth, He's going to take us out of that too through the rapture of the church. So as believers, no wonder God keeps saying, don't fear, 365 times in the Bible. We have nothing to fear. And everything to have faith in, to believe in, to put our trust in. And you know, if there's anything in your life that you're holding on to, today's the day to surrender it. Today's the day to take a step of faith, to go beyond just the learning, reading, praying. Today's the day to actually put your faith on it, to stand on it, to rest in it, to believe in it, and rejoice in it. We're going to take communion tonight. What I'd like uh, Richard and Joya to come on up, and we're going to pray... And I always say this, but this is so important. There's so many distractions in life. There's very few times that we actually get to spend time meditating, thinking about resting, putting everything away. And this is the time to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to give you all of my attention. I'm going to give you all of my mental focus. This is all about you right now. So let's just take these next few minutes as we have communion. We'll kind of dim the lights. We'll, we'll pray. And the ushers are going to pass around the communion. But you know what? Don't waste this time. This is about you and Jesus. That's it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much, Lord. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here, Lord. They've set themselves apart tonight to be with you, to get into your word, to prioritize their walks with you, to make you important, Lord. And that act in and of itself, Lord, is an act of getting a step away or taking a step away from their idols, Lord. It's an act of them stepping away from their shows, their TVs, their social media, whatever it may be. They're here. And they're worshiping you. They're in your word. They're praising you. They're attentive, Lord. And I pray a blessing on them, Lord. You tell us, Lord, that when we call upon you, Lord, and we purpose in our heart 
to focus on you, that, that you will show us great and wondrous things that we've never known, that you will work in our hearts, Lord. But, Lord, I want to pray. I want to pray that we would actually rest in what you say, Lord. No more mental roller coasters. No more allowing Satan to have his way in our thought process. But you know, Lord, it's just saying yes to you and yes to your word and resting in it. So guys, this is your time now. Ushers are going to pass out the elements. As they do, just hang on to it and we'll take it all together. But don't break your fellowship with the Lord right now. So we take these minutes just to think about the cross. We think about what Jesus endured. Think about the physical agony. But there's so much more than that. Every aspect of what we talked about tonight in judgment was poured out on Jesus. As we read these statements of judgment, as we hear about these nations that were judged, all of that went on Jesus Christ. So when we talk about judgment as a Christian in light of Jesus Christ it brings about an incredible joy in our hearts. Just as Jesus told his disciples that they should rejoice that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the more we understand Jesus, the more we see Him in even these scriptures in judgment. We think about His coming back in judgment. And to know that He loved us so much that He willingly, gladly bore our judgment on Himself. You know what? If you're, if you're a believer tonight, everything that we read actually has nothing to do with you. If you're a believer tonight, there's no such thing as punitive judgment anymore. When I think about my sin, completely gone, I can't help but think Jesus really loves me. Jesus really, really loves me. You know, I have a hard time getting my mind around that, how much He loves me. So we take communion tonight. Maybe some of those thoughts the Lord is speaking to you today. And you know, if you're having trouble connecting with the Lord, if you're having trouble knowing the love of Christ which passes knowledge, you know, you can actually pray that the Lord would strengthen your inner person so that you could know in a deeper way the love of Christ. 
Read Ephesians chapter 3, starting in about verse maybe 16, 17 tonight. But you know what the thing is? In order for us to continually grow and understand the height, depth, width, breadth, the fullness of God's love, it has to be the Holy Spirit expanding our capacity to know it. But I hope tonight, just at minimum, as you see these things of judgment and you put them in light of the cross, at, at minimum, you would know how much Jesus loves you. And that you would be set free tonight to go forward by faith with unconditional faith and trust in the Lord. And the cross then, as we come back to our understanding of the cross, to just think about, meditate, remember, just as Jesus told His disciples in the upper room, as we do that, all we have to know is that it is finished. It's all done. Jesus paid it all. All to Him we owe. These elements we hold in our hand, they're, they're a reminder. The body of Christ, of the blood of Christ, that was shed on the cross for our sins. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then will you join me in taking the Lord's Supper tonight? Let's take of the bread which represents the body of Jesus Christ. And let's take of the cup that represents the blood of Jesus Christ. So good. We're going to sing one more song. Let's all stand. And as we sing this last song, I just want to encourage you. If you believe in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, if you believe that His work on the cross was enough, then right now our hearts should not have a burden. Our hearts should be free. And what's left is that we can just praise God with a free and clear and sinless, reconciled heart to God. We have the best future. We have the best that God can give. And the highest plane that a human being can live on, and that's to live in fellowship with God and be indwelt by the Holy Spirit to empower us in the things of God. Let's worship the Lord. God bless you guys.